this morning. What a fantastic uh, occasion this is uh, to have uh, Professor Langer give a talk that is more technical in nature. As um, you may realize, Professor Langer gave us uh, two, <clears throat> two talks yesterday. He gave us a talk that was a talk of general interest. Uh, there were even high school kids and uh, you know, middle school kids in the audience, and, and I did a little due diligence, and I really tried to find out how good Professor Langer's talk was yesterday, so I checked with those kids, and they said they understood everything, they loved it. So, so, and I mentioned it to Professor Langer, and I said, I, 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 hope, I hope you don't take this wrong. I don't know if it's a compliment or not, but he said it is a compliment. If the kids understood it, that means that it was really, really good. So the kids understood it, we understood it, it was fantastic, it was phenomenal. Then immediately after that, uh, he went to the business school, to the Graduate School of Management, where he gave another talk uh, to the um, uh, primarily MBA students. It's an entrepreneurship uh, class taught by uh, uh, Jack Gill. It is about 50 st uh, MBA students and, and then about 10, 15 uh, engineering, bi uh, biomedical engineering students there, uh, PhD students. Uh, so, and that was very well received. Uh, there were some very distinct, clear lessons uh, there uh, that uh, not exactly an equation, but uh, a framework uh, describing how Professor Langer has done the amazing feat of, of getting 220 of his own patents uh, licensed out to different 220 companies commercializing products invented by him and his group out of 750 patents. That is, by any standards, it is an incredible, incredible statistic. That is on top of close to 1,100 uh, full-size papers, uh, and uh, many of those papers are in nature and science. So, I mean, an absolutely incredible combination. Professor Langer is a, uh, an institute uh, professor at MIT. He's one of 14 uh, such institute uh, professors. This is the highest, absolutely highest honor for, for any academic uh, uh, at MIT, that is, uh, that is a, an honor reserved for the very, very top uh, individuals. It is an incredible honor to have him here today, and today he's going to give us a more technical uh, presentation on uh, drug delivery. He's going to talk about uh, high-throughput uh, drug delivery, especially in conjunction with, uh, with uh, stem cells. So please join me in welcoming Professor Langer. Thank you very much. You know, by the way, it's important if you're going to lecture to have high school students to have very smart high school students. So the high school students I, that at least I saw, I think, were high school students who were Curry's sons who were clearly very, very smart. <laughs> so I think that that, that probably helped me. Uh, so um, at any rate, um, what, let me go over what I'd like to do today. So I'd like to try to go over two general topics. Topic one will be on, you know, yesterday, for those of you that were here, I talked about what I'd call invasive drug delivery, ways that all of types of procedures were implants or microspheres or things that you'd, uh, that you'd inject or implant in the body. Um, today, I'd like to go over a couple strategies that we're trying to do it non-invasively. Could we ever deliver even complex molecules through the skin, like by a transdermal patch, and could we deliver them by aerosols? Um, and I'd like to go over some, what I think are some interesting engineering principles that we've been working on in those areas. And then for the second part of the talk, I'd like to talk about what I'll call high throughput technologies. In fact, it's interesting, one, the person who's really uh, done a lot of the pioneering work in, in my lab on uh, high throughput technologies has been a, a, a postdoctoral fellow and then research associate named Daniel Anderson, who actually got his PhD at University of California at Davis and now has just joined the faculty at MIT. And I'll go over a number of ways that I think you can combine different types of chemistries with uh, various types of robotics to solve what I, I think are some important problems in, in, in drug delivery and ultimately even the stem cell area. So first, let me do the skin. And uh, people may be familiar with the fact that, you know, in the last 30 years, you know, as, as we would think about it, probably up until 1980, whenever you took a drug, almost always it would be by a pill, sometimes an injection. But the idea of a patch really historically is very, very new. First one came out in 1979. Uh, and the first really popular one, uh, which is these nitroglycerin patches shown here, uh, uh, came out 
in the 80s. Yet, and it's interesting, if you look at it, on the one hand, there are about 20 such patches that you can use for maybe 20 different drugs or drug combinations with sales maybe 10 to $20 billion a year. But for most drugs, I mean, so on the one hand, that's good. You know, they are being used. But the only types of drugs that really work on these patches are drugs that are unbelievably potent, meaning you don't need very much, that, and that really uh, have just the right chemical characteristics to go through skin, which isn't many drugs. So even though now, 31 years after the field started, uh, it turns out, like I say, just 20 drugs are, are, are available this way. And yet, it would be great if you could deliver more that way, uh, particularly for drugs that are, see, that, by the way, I should also point out, if drugs have what's called a, a, a first pass effect, meaning the liver is going to destroy it if you take it orally, that's really important to be able to do it by a patch. Uh, so at any rate, ha hasn't really worked. I mean, people haven't been able to figure out how to um, get more than those 20 drugs in. So about 20 years ago, uh, I had a postdoctoral fellow named Yossi Coast. He's now a uh, chaired professor at Ben-Gurion University in Israel. And he uh, became very interested in ultrasound. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we did. Before I do that, I should tell you a little bit about the skin, though. You know, why is it so hard to get drugs through the skin? Well. All the resistance, really, to transport is in the outermost skin layer. It's called the stratum corneum. It's only 15 layers thick. And if you looked at it under a microscope, it almost looks like a brick wall, bricks and mortar. So you have these dead cells, actually, called keratinocytes. And then you have these lipid bilayers. So these are like bricks, and these are like the mortar. And it provides a tough barrier to get through. But Yossi uh, had done some work in our laboratory looking at how ultrasound could affect transport through polymers. And we decided to see if ultrasound could affect transport through skin. Tell, let me tell you a little bit about ultrasound. Ultrasound actually is used in a variety of therapeutic applications today. Uh, the one that's most famous, I'm sure that everybody knows, is for babies, right? In other words, if a woman's having a baby, uh, they go to the doctor uh, you know, while they're pregnant. And you can even tell if it, you get an image, even tell if it's a boy or a girl. That, by the way, is. Uh, you use a very high frequency. So ultrasound, I should point out, is any frequency above 20 kilohertz. It, by the way, is also, though, ultrasound has been used in sports medicine at a different frequency uh, to try to get drugs into joints and things like that, maybe to relieve pain. It's also been used in liposuction uh, and dentistry um, at, at a very low frequency. The idea of liposuction is you can get rid of fat, and uh, it's been used in dentistry for cleaning. So it's actually been used in all these ranges. I'll come back to this a little later. So what Yossi and later Samir Metrigatri did, Samir is now a professor at uh, University of California at uh, Santa Barbara, is basically, here, here's a model that you could use for skin transport. Basically, in engineering, they have a, what's called a transport cell, like a, what's called a Franz diffusion cell. And it's actually fairly simple. You have two chambers, a compartment where you could put your drug, a compartment where you could see if something could get through. And here you have a membrane. And the membrane you use is actually dead skin. You take human cadaver skin. And, and human cadaver skin ends up being a really good model for, uh, for, for regular skin transport. And the reason is, is because, as I mentioned, your stratum corneum, which provides the resistance, that's dead anyhow. So a dead person is like a pretty good model for that, I guess. So at any rate, it's actually true. So, so uh, you could take other kinds of skins, but you know, it's uh, sadly, the available of dead people's skin is, you know, you can get some of that. Uh, it, so, so anyhow, you take this, and you basically could look at how much of drug goes from this side to this side. And you could put an ultrasound transducer, if that's what you're looking at, here. So we did some studies. Actually, the earliest studies we published on this were in the Journal of Clinical Investigation in 1987. And what Yossi found, and later Samir, was that, and this is with one drug, estradiol, was that if you didn't do ultrasound, you got a certain amount of transport. But if you applied ultrasound, the transport was a lot greater. In this case, 13 times higher. But what happened over the next, say, five or seven years wasn't so encouraging. After we published this, a lot of other people published things. And what they said is, well, this, you know, they, they really weren't able to get it to work very well. But they didn't always use the same conditions. Or, in fact, they never use the same conditions. Some people use different frequencies, and a lot of people use different drugs. And uh, 
But basically, after we published it, people basically said, well, it looks like under most conditions and for most drugs, this doesn't work. So Yossi, like I say, we did this in the 80s. And then Samir Mitragatri came to join our lab in the early 90s. And then I began collaborating with Dan Blankstein, who's actually a physicist, but also in our chemical engineering department. And we decided to take a much more fundamental look at how the ultrasound worked in the hopes that maybe we could explain why it worked under some cases and maybe not under others. So we postulated that maybe there could be four possible different mechanisms for ultrasound. We figured to get that to the bottom of this, we need to figure out the mechanism. One mechanism might be, you know, you're simply heating up the skin. That would enhance transport. We looked at that. Turns out, at least under the conditions we were doing it, we didn't heat up the skin at all. So that doesn't look like it was the effect. The sec second possibility is what we call convective uh, transport through hair follicles. I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, that, that's actually the way, uh, there's another phenomenon that people have studied called diontophoresis, which is electricity. That's how that works. A third possibility is mechanical oscillations, you know, ultrasounds, a pressure wave of the lipid bilayers, and the lipids were that mortar that I showed you. And finally, uh, maybe it could be cavitation-induced structural changes. So again, I'm going to just sort of give you the highlights of what we did, or what Samir did. But uh, so we ruled this out. Then what we did is we uh, took about 10 different molecules, 10 different model molecules. And we said if trans tra convective transport's important, the flux should be independent of the drug's lipophilicity. And we took drugs with about 10 different, uh, li uh, different uh, lipophilicities. And, and, and also, you'd see enhancement of charged drugs through the follicles. But we didn't see that. We saw the sonophoretic flux was proportional to the drug lipophilicity. And we didn't see any enhancement of charged drugs. So that made us think that this was unlikely to be the case. By the way, if ionophoresis was important, you would see that being the case. Mechanical effect is known from the literature that the, that, that the effect should be proportional to frequency. Yet we observed the opposite, that it was inversely proportional to frequency. So we might say that mechanical effects don't seem to be the mechanism either. So based on that, if those were the only four mechanisms, you could say by process of elimination, maybe it should be cavitation. Cavitation, by the way, for those of you not familiar with it, have how many people up, have opened up a bottle of champagne? Most of you. And when you open up the champagne, you see cavitation. That's the formation and oscillation of these bubbles. Um, and so what we did, so what Samir did, is we thought, well, if cavitation's important, um, that's going to really have to do with a lot of this oscillation. And this is described by this kind of frequency. And there's something we could call a cavitation threshold. And if you're above that cavitation threshold, these bubbles are unstable. Cavitation threshold's about 2.5 megahertz in this case. And what you see is if you exceed that, the effect goes away. But under regular conditions, as we saw earlier, the effect's quite substantial. But exceed the cavitation threshold, the cavitation goes away. So this gives you further evidence that maybe cavitation is going on. So Samir was, wanted to write this up. But you know, see, if you're a professor, you always could tell the student that you want a little bit more evidence. So I said, can you come up with any other ways to look at this? And, and so basically, what he did is said, well, if cavitation's important, what, if you put something under high pressure, then again, it's going to be very hard for the cavitation to occur. So what he did is compress the skin under 30 atmospheres, compared it to normal skin. And again, you get a big effect when it's not under uh, pressure, but the effect pretty much goes away when it is under pressure. So this would provide even further evidence that cavitation might be what's going on. And I said, that's, I was, so, I was happy with that. But I said, Samir, maybe, maybe one more set of experiments. And um, so then uh, what he did is, again, if cavitation, as I mentioned, are these bubbles being formed, what if you degas the skin? Then they couldn't form, right? So he then did another set of experiments. Again, he came up with all these ideas himself. And he degassed the skin. And again, the effect goes away. This is without de regular skin, degas skin. So all these things kept pointing to the fact that cavitation uh, might be what's going on. So then the next thing you know, that we always like to do in chemical engineering at MIT is build some type of model to predict what's going on. So what we're suggesting is that maybe here's what's going on. Here's the stratum corneum again with the bricks and mortar. And here's these bubbles. And what we're thinking about is that these bubbles are formed. And, and again, we have gas. You know, There's dissolved gas in your skin all the time. Uh, and what we're speculating is that maybe these bubbles um, 
cause a disruption of these lipid bilayers. And when they do, that makes it easier. For, you know, normally they have this ordering, but if they, this, if they cause a disordering, then it's going to be easier for things to pass through. So what we're then suggesting is the reason for enhanced transport is bilayer disordering. The ultrasound disorders a fraction of the bilayers called F. And you could actually make a measurement of this by electrical resistance. It's actually amazing. I've actually done it myself. If you actually apply ultrasound to your skin, you can actually see the resistivity of your skin change uh, quite, quite uh, markedly. And, uh, and then we had a couple models being built. David Edwards, who was a postdoc with me now, professor at Harvard, uh, basically developed models through both disordered lipids and normal uh, uh, lipids and, and Wilkie had also done some of that. So we have an enhancement ratio, which is going to be the fraction of, of uh, disordering, which you measure by the resistance, over these two diffusion coefficients. And if you plug these in, let's just take a look at seven different uh, molecules. This is real data in, in, in a number of different experiments. And what you see is very interesting. For some drugs, Notice there's absolutely no enhancement. In other words, one would be no enhancement. So as I mentioned to you earlier, after we published this paper, some people found with some drugs they got no enhancement. And others found with certain conditions they didn't get uh, enhancement either. But what you can see is depending on the drug and on its, the ratio of these two diffusion coefficients, you could get very significant enhancement. Others you get moderate enhancement. Others you get none at all. And you could predict that based on, on these diffusion coefficients and on the model. And, and, and what you see for these red lines are the model bounding. These are the errors. So, if it's, so the model actually is bounded by these red bars. So they predict fairly well what's going on experimentally. Now, people always might ask you, if you're an engineer, what's the value of a model? Well, the value of a model might be a couple things. One, you could predict things. But two, I think the bigger point is that it gives you insight. And when we looked at this, Samir and Dan and I said, you know, that's very interesting. What all this is telling us is that cavitation is inversely proportional to ultrasound frequency, which you just saw. And what we had done before was we operated in our study in, in, in the Journal of Clinical Investigation up here. When other people published things, actually they used what they did for the babies. They operated under really high uh, megahertz. So it might not be surprising that people, if they operated up here, didn't get it to work. Uh, so what all this tells us is really, when you now understand that this is what's going on, that we were all, ourselves and everybody else, looking in the wrong place. We were probably doing it at the wrong frequency. So what we said is, if this is really true, let's go to very low frequencies and see how we do there. So we did that. We started doing it at very low frequencies. And this is from a paper we published in Science uh, a number of years ago. And we're taking human cadaver skin. And now we took three fairly large molecules, uh, insulin, gamma interferon, and erythropoietin, and we compared what the therapeutic dose would be uh, to the experimental dose. Um, and we could see that this is for an hour delivery. But we could see we could come pretty close to what you actually get um, therapeutically uh, with the ultra, uh, to, to what you need with the ultrasound if you had it on for an hour. And we even then did it in an animal study with insulin. Uh, and again, animals have easier skin to get through than humans by quite a bit. But still, it was a, we felt a good demonstration that you could lower the blood sugar level by giving insulin non-invasively to these animals to a normal level. So then, um, basically, what we wanted to do was see if we could actually even move this, as I talked about yesterday, one of my goals is to see if we can help people. So the first thing we wanted to do is see if it's safe on people. And uh, you know, MIT has this program called the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, which is a Europe program. So a lot of the Europe's all volunteered to be uh, tested with this. I'm, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> But actually, it's actually true. One day, I'll just tell you a story, which is actually true. I had these two graduate students, Samir Mitragatri and Mark Johnson. And they were both doing their PhD thesis on this. And they were actually very excited about it. So they once came in my office like, all, with all these needles in their arm. And I said, what the heck are you guys doing? And they said, well, we wanted to see if this works. And uh, so they basically uh, applied, and I'll get to this more in a minute, about therapeutically where this is going. They took some pain medication. Uh, they put it in their skin. Didn't do anything. But then they applied the ultrasound. 
and, and then they put the needles in and they saw they didn't feel any pain. I, mean, it's, it's, I, I, I never told the Human Studies Commission at MIT about it. But, but I mean, I, it, it's very hard to control Sue. They were actually very excited about it. But anyhow, this is actually Samir's arm. He also wanted to test it on himself. And, and, and this is an early study that we did where he took the ultrason the sonicator, put it with a little bit of water, and there's almost no sensation. It's probably a little bit less sensation than a shower that you'd feel. And it didn't hurt. You know, we did about 40 people, and it didn't hurt um, anybody. So um, then, actually, uh, based on, on what they did, and again, I won't go through all the clinical trials, but they actually got FDA approval uh, for this, uh, for pain medication. So today, if somebody has a, you know, there's a thing called Emla cream, which they put on. Normally, it takes a couple hours to work. But now, if you apply the ultrasound, you can get it to work in a minute or two. And they, they use that in a lot of situations. This is what it looks like. It's a now marketed product. I think it won the thing for the biggest uh, scientific advance in popular science a couple years ago. But, uh, but basically, this is just an example. So you can now get skin anesthesia. Then it was five minutes. Now I think it's one or two minutes. And you can also go the opposite way. In other words, you can not only deliver pain medications, but it also occurred to us and again, we're still working on this, but um, that, see, if you could deliver things, and again, now there's companies trying to non-invasive deliver other things, like they've done insulin in clinical trials and things like that. Still not a product yet, but maybe someday it will be. But see, the other way you could go is if you can deliver things through the skin, well, maybe you could sense things as well, right? Because if you open a pathway, like I showed you, well, not only things could go one way, but they could go the other. So you could get interstitial fluid out. So here's the ultrasound hand transducer. Here's the stratum cornea. And you could put different things in the donor compartment and see if, you, if they would diffuse now rather than this way, would they diffuse this way up? And so again, Samir and Mark Johnson and others did this. And this is looking at glucose, which could actually be a huge deal. This could be uh, you know, this sort of what people would love to do is could you ever come up with a non-invasive glucose monitor that would be continuous. And this is just a, a, a pretty standard curve showing that you get pretty good accuracy when you do this. And this has uh, now been done on uh, about 1,000 patients, uh, and, and, and hopefully it will lead to a new product someday. And you could analyze other things, too. These are just different analytes. So at any rate, this is a, an example of trying to use some basic engineering principles to accomplish non-invasive delivery and non-invasive sensing. Let me give you a second example. Uh, and and I, for the business lecture, people that went to the business lecture, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. But um, and this is always, like I think, a, a really interesting example of, uh, of how a, an engineer David Edwards, in this case, who worked in our lab, came up with an interesting principle, which actually had a fundamental change in aerosol science. So basically, in 1993, David Edwards was a guy who came to our lab. He had already done two postdocs and had his PhD. And at this point in his career, he'd written 30 papers and two books. But interestingly, he'd never done an experiment in his life. He basically, as a number of engineers are, was you know, very theoretical. He just uh, did all kinds of uh, the mathematical modeling. In fact, the very first problem he worked on in our laboratory was transdermal drug delivery. And I remember he gave me this first paper he gave me had 300 equations in it. And I always felt my big contribution was reducing it to 250. <laughs> and, but I mean, so, but then I mentioned to him, I said, you know, David, there's this area. He hadn't done some modeling of the lung. And I mentioned to him, I said, there's this area that maybe we might be able to make a contribution in. And I said, that's pulmonary delivery. At this point in time, 1993, 1994, there were a variety of companies and academic groups trying to deliver drugs to the lung. And one of the things that we saw was that it was incredibly inefficient. You were lucky if you got 2% of the drug from the pulmonary device into the lung. And the reason for that is everybody thought that the uh, pulmonary delivery, uh, the particles had to be really small, like 2 microns or so. The thinking was that if they were bigger, like say 5 or 10 microns, they'd settle in the back of your throat. So if they were 2 microns, the problem is that when you put them in the aerosolizer, it's kind of like wet sand. They're so small, there's so much surface area, they aggregate. They aggregate in the device, they aggregate in the air, they aggravate in your mouth, and very little gets to the deep lung. So you get about 2%. So how did people try to solve that? Well, most 
companies and academics tried to solve it by mechanical engineering. They would build a better aerosolizer with more power and more bells and whistles to break apart those sand-like aggregates. And there was all kinds of fascinating designs. But the best probably anybody did was go from 2% to 3%, which is actually still pretty good, right? If you go from 2% to 3%, that saves you 50% in the cost. And you make the aerosolizer, which was one of the big challenges, 50% smaller. But still, it wasn't you know, a quantum leap. So everybody looked at the aeros aerosolizers. What David started thinking about from his modeling background, he says, you know, Bobby said, nobody has ever looked at the aerosol. Now you might think, how could you change an aerosol? Uh, when you think of aerosols, most of the time maybe you think of uh, meter dose inhalers and nebulizers. They're all water, right? How do you change water? But a few people had made at that time what we call dry powder inhalers. They used powders. But nonetheless, whenever they did this, the density of the of water and of any of these dry powders was about one gram per cc. What David started thinking about is, so all the aerosols that had ever been designed up to this point were basically non-porous, one gram per cc. He started wondering, what if he made the aerosols really big, but incredibly light, incredibly porous? Like maybe they'd have a density, say, of 0.1 gram per cc. And he modeled this. And he, what he did is, when he modeled this, Aerodynamically, it turns out that when you make them big and light, they will float into the deep lung. They won't settle in the back of the throat. But because they're big, they won't aggregate to the same degree. Like wet basketballs, for example, aren't going to aggregate like wet sand, right? The surface area is much different. So that totally changed how much would get lost. Also, the other thought we had is that if the aerosols were really big, see, normally the aerosols don't last very long either. Because when they get into the lung, there's cells called macrophages, and they eat uh, the aerosols. So what we started thinking is that's a process called phagocytosis. So what we started thinking about was that if the aerosols were really big, um, then it's kind of like eating a big meal. It takes a long time. In contrast to a small meal, which was the normal case, it took a short time. So we thought maybe there'd be two advantages. One, maybe we could get a lot more in. And two, maybe we could make it last longer if we could make porous aerosols. So we had a number of people in our laboratory. Noah Lotan, who came did a sabbatical from Technion. Uh, Jeff Herkash, who was a postdoc with me. Noah Lot. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Justin Haynes, who's now a professor at Johns Hopkins. Giovanni Caponetti, and they worked out ways to make these aerosols. And let me just actually, and they can be done very simply by spray drying and other techniques. Let me just show you a picture. So this is one of the porous aerosols. And, and let me also just give you a sports analogy. So if you, uh, this is actually very simple, but if if you think about it. Um, before we were involved, all the aerosols, looked, if you looked at them under a microscope, would look like a little golf ball or a little baseball, right? They're just solids. All we did, this is so, so simple really when you think about it, all we did is make them look like wiffle balls. I mean, it's just a simple geometric change, but that simple geometric change changes everything. So this is what they look like. These are the wiffle ball-like aerosols. So first to test this, we use something called an Anderson impactor. And this is like different plates. And you can see whether you get whether it's respirable or not. And if it's non-porous, you get very little in. If it's porous, you get about not just 50% more, but you get uh, 10 times more, a huge number more in. Then we went, David and the others did in vivo experiments with uh, forced respiration. And you basically now again, uh, this is from a paper we wrote in Science, um, uh, get uh, 10 times more in in vivo as well. And ultimately, we took this into um, humans. Um, this is just showing three-day release of uh, estradiol um, in, in humans. And as I went over in the business lecture yesterday, I won't go over this so much today, but David uh, and I, I had the good fortune to be involved in it too, started an extremely successful company called Advanced Inhalation Research, you know, which really fundamentally changed the way how aerosols are used. And also one of the things that he's doing now, which I think is a really nice thing, is, is they're actually not only using them now for different commercial drugs, but one of the big, big problems in the third world is uh, people get tuberculosis. So with the aid of the Gates Foundation, they're now doing clinical trials for uh, different types of drugs they want to give for tuberculosis, like BCG. These are protein drugs which are, are very unstable. And normally, they're given by injection. And the problem when you give these by injection is first, um, is first these molecules are unstable you know, in very warm climates. They're in liquid form. And secondly, 
um, you have to have trained personnel to do the injections. What they're now doing is making these tiny aerosolizers, and you couldn't do this before because the aerosolizers would have been gigantic, but David's making these tiny aerosolizers uh, with the drug in solid form. So now, you know, people basically carry the aerosolizer in their pocket, and the drugs are much more stable because they're in solid rather than liquid form. So that's just an example. Uh, there are a variety of others, too. Well, so, so these two examples that I gave you are examples that we tried to figure things out through hypotheses. And, uh, and, and hopefully, as we went through these hypotheses, we came up with better ways to understand things. And sometimes you can do that. But sometimes things get so complicated that, you, that, at least in my experience, we haven't been able to do it very well. And for that, and that's where I thought I'd spend the rest of the talk, is if, when we haven't been able to come up with good hypotheses, there's another way that we could attack it if, we, if, if maybe we and the people who work with us are clever. And that's by using high throughput technologies. And I thought I'd give you some examples of that. So um, first one actually has to do with a company we started that I talked a little bit about yesterday. But it was my, one of my first uh, ventures into this area. And so I consulted for the pharmaceutical industry, I still do, um, for many, many years. And when I'd watched these pharmaceutical companies like Merck and Pfizer and everybody, there were various steps that they, that, and various divisions of the company. For, you know, they might do drug discovery. They might do uh, uh, cloning. They might do purification. The very last thing they would do with these companies is what we call formulation. And that might sound simple. That's kind of like drug delivery. It might sound simple, but actually it's not so simple. It turns out that about 50% of the time when a company makes a drug, it's not even soluble in, in water. And, another, and so one of the big challenges is to put it in a form that a patient can take it, and that'll actually get into the body. A second big challenge, which also might sound simple and isn't, is to get it into the right crystal form. Uh, and the reason that's important, as, as if you start to think about it, when you get a drug made, it's shipped all over the world. And uh, you might not use it for two years. That's what's called the shelf life. And so if it's not in the right crystal form, it's going to be unstable. Uh, and it won't work either. So that, that's why they have expiration dates on your drugs. So it has to be in the right crystal form. So what I'd see happen is the company might work for years and years on a project. And then it finally gets to this last stage, formulation. And they might spend, they may never solve the problem. And I'll give you some examples. But uh, basically, what I'd noticed when I consulted for these companies in the 80s and 90s is they might do 10 to 20 experiments, all by hand, all by the scientists, over a couple months, not really analyze the data. And what I started thinking about, along with Nick Galakatos, who's a venture capitalist, is maybe we could change that. Maybe we could do, bring robotics into this and do hundreds, in fact, thousands, tens of thousands of experiments much quicker. And whenever we do them, Maybe we could analyze what's going on, look at the structures, and use informatics to help us do the next set of experiments. So I thought just to give you an idea, a feeling for high throughput, and I'll give you a few examples of high throughput, I thought I'd show you a video. And the video will show you the following. You'll see uh, the robots uh, putting things in vials under different crystallization conditions, different seeding conditions. And then you'll see all this high throughput work going on where all of these drugs are going to be analyzed for the right crystal form by uh, x-ray diffraction, melting point, and finally uh, Raman spectroscopy. All, again, done in a high throughput form. Let me show you the video. So here's the robots just filling everything up. We have people helping too, but the robot's doing a lot. And then it's gonna, this is the x-ray diffraction. We have online. Michael Simo, also one of my colleagues, helped a lot on this. This is real-time Raman spectroscopy. Basically gives you fingerprints of what crystal structures you're getting. So this is giving you thousands of, of checking each of these vials at once. So it bins all the data. And what you see in this case, three crystal forms, one, two, and three. By the way, each of these crystal forms is like a, a, what's called a different polymorph. And they all have a different kind of fingerprint. That tells you what you get. So in that case, we got three crystal forms. In some cases, you get, may get more. In some cases, you may get less. But the interesting thing is, see, rather than take, and, and this is really true, and I'll give you an example in a minute, it might take you, before we got involved, 10 years to do that same amount of work. And, and now we can do it really fast, and you can find everything that might ever happen. Let me give you a second example. This is now solubility. So again, I mentioned sometimes it's hard to get the right solubility. So here's an example where arbitrarily we're going to say, let's say we want to get above the red bar. So with our first set of experiments, we put all different combinations of excipients in. Most of them do not get above the red bar, but few do. 
you could take the chemical structures of the excipients that get you above that bar and use that for your next set of experiments. And when you do that, using that, you do better. You could then take the chemical structures of these, feed that in, and helps you design your next set of experiments, and you do better still. So by going through this procedure, again, doing thousands and thousands of experiments and iterating intelligently, we're able to do better. So let me just give you two quick examples of this. The first one is a, actually a, a true story and actually an important story. In the 1990s, Abbott had a very successful drug called Norvir, Ritonavir. It was a big selling AIDS drug, sold hundreds of millions of dollars a year. It was one of the most successful AIDS drugs treatments there was. Uh, but interestingly, a year and a half after they launched it, see, originally it was polymorph one, but somehow, and they never understood it, they still don't understand it, it converted to polymorph two. They, that polymorph was 50% less soluble, so it didn't behave the same way. And since it didn't behave the same way, it didn't work as well. And the FDA told them, pull it off the market. It's not the same drug anymore. So they spent two years trying to get it, trying to make it to polymorph one. Two years. They never were able to do it. And ultimately, what they did is put it into a liquid form, which was much harder for patients to use. You know, probably cost them billions of dollars. They never solved the problem. But six years later, at Transform, using this now robotics and high-throughput approach, in two weeks, actually, the, our scientists basically found form one, found form two, and three other forms that nobody ever had reported before. But it just shows you that you can get the, you know, by using these ultra-rapid methods, you can find things that you might never find before. The second example, I won't go into scientifically, but one of the things, and this has to do with more of the solubility. So Alza, which is a very uh, successful company, in California, now part of Johnson & Johnson, uh, did a lot on transdermal delivery. And so Transform had an arrangement with ALZA. And Transform was able to do more experiments in one month than ALZA did in 30 years. And the consequence of all this, ultimately Johnson & Johnson bought Transform, but it's now already led to three FDA-approved products and, and I think fundamentally changed how people in the pharmaceutical industry think. Now, that, now we also in our laboratory have, um, have, have done high-throughput things for a variety of other problems too, many involving new chemistries. That doesn't involve new chemistries. This next example is gene therapy. And gene therapy really is a serious delivery problem. This is from Time Magazine. Inder Verma at the Salk, when he was president of the Gene Therapy Society, he was interviewed. He said, well, they said, why isn't gene therapy working better? He said, well, there's only three problems, delivery, delivery, and delivery. And what happened was, as people would try viral vectors, but, but people may know that viral vectors have run into some huge safety problems. Sometimes people have died. And then people use synthetic vectors, like a polymer or a lipid, but they don't work very well. So in about 1997, 1997 Bob Grubbs, who's a very well-known chemist at Caltech, uh, called me up. He said, Bob, my very best postdoc, David Lynn, would like to come to your lab. And uh, so David came to our lab. And what he was interested in was synthesizing polymers for gene therapy. But up until this time, we had actually worked in this area. And I should say we probably did a terrible job. We were pretty unsuccessful. But David thought, well, and we had all these hypotheses. Unfortunately, our hypotheses didn't work very well. But David started thinking, well, what about some chemistries that we could apply to make polymers? And the particular thought that he had is, what if he does what's called a Michael addition? of an amine to a diacrylate. So this is an amine to a diacrylate. Now, just, just for background, normally what, when we synthesize a polymer, it takes us a long time. Uh, I might have made things sound simple yesterday, but they aren't. If you try to synthesize a polymer, usually you start with a monomer, a small molecule, and then there's certain functional groups, and you have to block them so they won't participate in the reaction. Then you do a reaction. Then you have to unblock them. Then you have to purify. And then you go through it again and again until you have your polymer. It might take you 30, 40, 50 steps, and you might get yields of 0.01%. It's not uncommon, especially for us. So what, so what was interesting is what David Lynn started thinking about was if he used this particular chemistry, amine to diacrylate with a Michael addition, then just because of this unique one-to-one -one correspondence, rather than take 40 steps, you could make the polymer in a single step. You wouldn't get byproducts. You wouldn't have to protect or deprotect. And then, depending on the diversity of starting materials, you could have all kinds of different ones. And so for the first time, even though people have done high throughput for small molecules, now with David's idea, maybe we could do high throughput for large molecules. 
This next slide I don't expect anybody to memorize. But David worked with uh, Dan Anderson. I actually put them in the, sa in the same office. And Dan, as I, so David was, like I say, uh, got his PhD from uh, chemistry department at Caltech. Dan was actually a molecular biologist, got his PhD from here. And they were in the same office. And, and they, they, were, they became very good friends. And what they did in this experiment is basically take 94 different amino monomers. And the only thing really to show you is the diversity, just very different structures, and 25 different diacrylates. And literally, they took each one of these, reacted it with each one of these, made over 2,000 different polymers. And some of them worked great. In fact, they, now they've made even more. They've taken the end groups and derivatized those, fractionated them, and so forth. But just to show you a couple highlights, um, that one of the polymers, uh, this is in vitro, um, works better than a conventional polymer like polyethylenamine, better than adenovirus. Here's actually an experiment we did with Rudy Janish to see if we could even transfect stem cells. Uh, and and, and uh, one of the, so what you see is here's a typical reagent, lipofectamine, which is used. But here's again uh, the, uh, the, the, the polymer for doing gene therapy working far, far better than the lipofectamine. By the way, just to give you an idea of, of, of where we might go on this is that people may know that one of the big advances, I think, in the last few years have been IPS cells, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. But right now, generally, most of the ways that people make these induced pluripotent stem cells is to use, re is to use viral vectors, which won't be safe. Here, we could maybe use synthetic vectors, which actually could be safe. So we're working with Rudy on that um, as, w as well. And, 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 and we're also, and this is just to give a few highlights, but you know, we're also working on a variety of new therapies for uh, ovarian cancer, uh, various genetic diseases, and there are a variety of reagents now on the market based on this. So, so one thing that you could do is, then again with high throughput, is deliver things like DNA. The other thing we started thinking about, though, that might be obvious is, what about the opposite? In other words, you could turn a gene on, could you turn one off? So one of the other big advances that's happened in the last 10, 15 years is the discovery of siRNA, small interfering RNAs. But again, just like I think if you talk to most biologists, they would probably tell you that one of the biggest problems in the siRNA field is, again, delivery. How could you do that? Well, one of the areas that has received a lot of attention for delivery over the last 50 years are liposomes. And people have looked at this, and people are using liposomes to deliver siRNA with moderate success. But when we looked at this, Dan and I, Anderson and I, one of the things that was interesting to us is that for the last 50 years since the discovery of liposome, probably they've used about 20 different lipids. And we thought, that's not very many. You know, and so it's no wonder maybe they don't work that well sometimes because maybe they're not, the lipids aren't the right lipids. So what we thought again, why couldn't we use a high throughput approach using this type of chemistry to make uh, all kinds of lipids, and maybe we'd find ones that would work really well. So here we're looking now again at this Michael addition to take the acrylate and the amine and now make lipid materials in a combinatorial fashion. And just again to show you what's being done, and again, the only thing I want you to notice is the diversity. Nobody needs to take this down. But all different types of lipids you could use. Notice all of these. And it's not just the R groups, but you could change the length of the tail, right, from 10 to 18, you could also change the number of tails, like this is five tails, four tails, three tails. So again, you could have enormous chemical diversity. That's really my only point, enormous chemical diversity. And when you do this, what we did is not only test it in cells, um, but we also tested it in animals. And we developed with Alnylam, a local company, a non-invasive assay for doing that. We uh, combined the lipids with things like polyethylene glycol and cholesterol and phosphatidylcholine, uh, along with whatever siRNA that you want to use. I should probably make an aside and tell you why at least I think RNA is an exciting drug. See, most drugs that you use, like small molecule drugs, they probably hit, you know, they're, they're, even though they work a lot of times, sometimes they, their, their specificity isn't so great. The beauty of siRNA is its specificity. I mean, you could knock down a single gene and nothing else. So here, what we're doing as a non-invasive assay is just knocking down the gene for factor seven. And all you have to do is take a little bit of blood, you don't sacrifice the animal, and you can see what you get. And here what we see is we did some experiments where we knocked down, very specifically, factor seven with one of our lipidoids, knocked it down, this is about 80% knockdown. Uh, 
here we knock down another, and here we knock down ApoB. Again, these are just different siRNAs that we've combined. This is about 65% knockdown. So depending on the siRNAs you use, you can knock down almost any one single set of genes you want. I'll come back to this later because it provides a very good way of helping people who have high cholesterol levels. So what we discovered was out of all these lipidoids, this particular one worked the best. Actually, this was on the cover when we published it for Nature Biotechno of Nature Biotechnology. Uh, and also is in nature and cell. And this is just a simple experiment showing you now in monkeys that if you did controls, which could be a mismatched siRNA, you don't get much of a change in factor seven. But a single injection in primates, you basically last for somewhere from two weeks to a month. You know, it goes back up. You just do it again and again. But basically, you get this sort of 30 days before it comes back. So we did it actually in four animal species, uh, including primates. And you also can get a dose response curve. This is phosphate buffer saline, mismatched siRNA. And if you do a dose response curve, you can get almost 100% knockdown uh, with a high enough dose. And this is just the study that I was alluding to before, that if you take, um, if you take the, um, the, the lipid going against ApoB, and now this is monkeys, you get about a 50% knockdown two days later of LDL cholesterol. So what that means is say you had cholesterol of 300 milligrams, now you have 150. So you could basically uh, possibly use this in, 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 in an example like this. Now, what we then did if, is as we look at this whole field, and I think as the people who are in this field look at it, the biggest issue that people are still worried about with siRNA is, is the potency. We're still giving a reasonable amount of siRNA to do this. So we wanted to try to see if we could lower it. And so what Kevin Love did, this is just a very recent paper, is we changed the chemistry a little bit. We used ring opening epoxide chemistry uh, and basically, again, took a whole bunch of different um, amines and epoxides and basically uh, selected amines from our original libraries with a bias towards good performing amines in our previous libraries. And when we did this, um, what we found was actually very exciting. Again hundreds and hundreds of new lipidoids, but this was our earlier one where to get, uh, we'd get some knockdown with 1.5 mg per kg, but now in this new study we're using our newer lipidoids, we can get some knockdown at incredibly low levels. This is by far the lowest we've seen in the literature, uh, and, and, and this is in mice, with 0.003 mg per kg. So this is incredibly small amounts of siRNA, incredibly small amounts of lipid. And that's actually very important when you think about moving this into the clinic. And, and just as an example of that, we've now gone into primates and pretty much shown the same thing, that even going to, that you get a pretty significant knockdown of uh, transthyretin in monkeys at doses of less than 0.03 mg per kg. So right now, our hope is to take these highly potent uh, lipidoids and move them into human clinical trials in the next year or so uh, for a variety of different diseases. Well, the very last, oh, and, and this is just one other study showing th that Dan did where he actually took 10 different siRNAs, put them in the lipids, and just knocked down 10 different genes. Something like this might be useful, for example, someday uh, if uh, people understand the pathways for certain types of cancer treatments and so forth. Well, I thought I would spend the last uh, five, ten minutes of this talk going over an example of how you might use high throughput approaches to help in the stem cell area. And, you know, so almost everybody when we've looked at the stem cell area has been looking at how growth factors and things and soluble factors can affect uh, stem cell behavior. But there's been very little work on how polymers or insoluble factors can affect stem cell behavior. And yet, if you think about it, cells are not only exposed to soluble factors in the body, but they're sitting on extracellular matrix all the time. There must be effects of extracellular matrix and probably very powerful effects, but there hasn't been a really good way to understand it or study it. So what we wanted to see is could we identify polymers now, solid polymers that could control cell behavior. But testing whether that would work often requires tedious, expensive methods like immunohistochemistry, fluid handling issues, and some cells, particularly stem cells, are difficult and expensive to grow in large quantities. So how to solve that? So Dan Anderson, again, this is from a paper we published in uh, Nature Biotech, we thought, well, maybe a way to address this, and again, 
is to use robotics and, and, and chemistry to create microarray polymers and literally come up with thousands and tens of thousands of different substrates and see how the different ones would affect stem cell behavior. How could you do that? How could you make these arrays? Well, it's actually challenging. What we want to do is synthesize large number, and I mean tens of thousands, of diverse materials in nanoliter volumes. And what we want to do is, is, is actually, just to simplify it, is do all these on microscope slides. We want to attach our, our materials to the slide in a manner that's compatible with the different materials we're using and in a water environment. We don't want the water, of course, to ultimately dissolve the, um, the, the polymer. And also, since you want these arrays, you want to study the individual spots that I showed you in the last slide. So you want cell growth on the polymer spots, but you don't want them in between the polymer spots. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that a little bit more. And finally, we wanted to allow si simple simultaneous assays of different cellular markers. So once again, uh, we use, in this case, acrylate chemistry. These are acrylates shown here. This is the reaction. Acrylate, the beauty of acrylate chemistry is all you have to do, and people may have seen this in dental area, if you just put the monomer in and you shine a light on it, it'll polymerize. So we could actually use a robot to print these spots and then shine the light and it'll polymerize. And so again, we could have all these different polymers that we could uh, do. And what we did is to solve the problem I mentioned before is we've got the microscope slide. We put a polymer that cells cannot stick to, polyethyl methacrylate, hydroxyethyl methacrylate, so that's the material in a soft contact lens. And then we drop with the robot the polymer drop. And the polymer drops would be different monomers mixed at different ratios. And again, you'd get enormous, this is just one set of things, you get enormous diversity. So what we did is we would print 1,500 to 3,500 individual polymer composites on a single slide, and the cells only grow on the spots. They can't grow on the polymer between them. That cells won't adhere to it. So here's the spot and here's the cells. So, and, and really when you do this, let's say you took 20 slides, that means you could do up to 70,000 experiments in a single day. You take it and you could put other things on them. And the robot does a lot of this. This is what the slide looks like. So I thought I would just show you, uh, this is, and you could assay them using uh, DNA chips. So I thought I would just give you two examples to end this talk of, of really, I think, interesting problems you could solve this way. So the first one is could we convert human embryonic stem cells to skin cells? So again, you could take all these different polymers, plate them down, and find out using a marker for the skin cells, cytokeratin, that a couple of the spots will actually convert the stem cells into skin cells. You could also look at other markers. You could actually also look at other things. You could also find that depending on the uh, polymer composition, the cells, you might find polymers where the cells grow really well. You might find polymers where the cells grow terribly. And this is also important because some type of stem cells are hard to grow fast enough you know, for human transplantation. And, and, and finally, in this set of experiments, you could, do all, you could, again, do all different types of experiments. You could put growth factors like retinoic acid on. So these are just different polymer compositions. Here you could put retinoic acid on at day six. You could pulse it at day six. You don't have to put it on at all. You could put it on at day one. You don't put it on at all. You could just imagine the number of different combinations you could do, thousands, tens of thousands. And when you're done, you could find conditions that support the growth of human embryonic stem cells or inhibit it. Polymers that support it only in certain media and polymers that support the growth only of certain cell types. So like I mentioned, this was in Nature Biotech a couple of years ago, and it basically provides a way of using substrates to basically control stem cell differentiation uh, and stem cell growth. But there's one other thing that we thought about when we did this experiment that we thought might fundamentally change the stem cell field. And this doesn't always get a lot of publicity, but I always thought it should during the last eight years of the Bush administration uh, when you use stem cell lines. And that's the fact that even though there were a few, maybe 20 cell lines approved, every single cell line that's ever been approved, every single cell line that's ever been approved, the way they grow those stem cells and the way they grow the embryoid bodies is to grow them on mouse feeder layers. In other words, so, so they're contaminated. I mean, this is not in the newspaper so often, uh, but basically every single line will be contaminated because here's the human uh, uh, you know, pluripotent stem cells, you're, but you're growing them on these mouse feeder layers. So they're passaged to small clumps of cells. And if you try to isolate them out, it's clear that you're going to have uh, contamination. 
And, and so because you maintain them on these mouse feeder layers, uh, that's MEF, Production is going to be laborious. It limits large-scale production of them. And you're clearly going to have animal pathogens and mouse immunologic protein contamination. I mean, even if it's small levels, it's an incredibly dangerous thing. Every single line has grown this way. Because of that, in the last couple of years, we and others have tried to look at non-mouse lines. But it really hasn't worked well. We've published some papers on this. Others have too. But none of them have worked very well. They don't support efficient growth. Uh, they don't support long-term growth, and they don't support clonal growth. So once again, uh, uh, what we did, this was like a huge co interdisciplinary collaboration. We work with Rudy Janish, who's probably one of the top stem cell biologists in the world. We work with Martin Davies' lab, our collaborators at Nottingham, who did high-throughput surface analysis. Uh, and we worked with uh, Kristen Van Vliet at MIT, who did a lot of uh, mechanical analysis. But basically, again, we took different monomers, uh, again, with acrylates, and we'd react different ones of these with different ones of these. And the way we do it is you just shine the light and acrylate one with acrylate two, this is what you get. And again, we get this huge polymer library. And what we did is we screened for two genes that would be indicative of, uh, of human embryonic stem cells. We also did this for iPS cells as well. This is SEA, SSEA4 and OC4. And what we found when we did this, that monomer 9 on the last slide, copolymerized with monomer A, shows comparable efficiency even after 10 passages to mouse embryonic feeder layers. And we did, like I say, all kinds of structure function relationships. This has not come out yet. It will come out in Nature Materials in a couple of months. Uh, but basically, we wondered what it would correlate with. It doesn't correlate with surface roughness, as judged by uh, atomic force microscopy. doesn't judge with hydrophobicity, as judged by uh, you know, contact angles. doesn't, judge, uh, doesn't uh, 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 correlate with elastic modulus, based on Kristen's work. What it does correlate with, according to what Martin did, are various surface structures with hydrocarbon ions, oxygen-containing ions, and ions from cyclic structures. What's exciting is after 10 passages, you get full pluripotent potential as judged by, and Rudy's very tough. He makes sure that we do every single thing that could ever be judged for a stem cell. But uh, five different genes, human karyotype, gene expression. This is injecting them into all and finding all three germ lineages in animals. And the ultimate system now that we've developed is chemically defined, xeno-free, meaning it's uh, all, all human, not mouse or anything else, and feeder-free. So we hope that by doing that, this, uh, when, when it comes out, will provide a fundamental way of creating new materials that could be tools and broadly useful for stem cell biology, growing these stem cells, and ultimately bringing them into human patients. Let me stop here. Again, it's been an absolute honor for me to be here at Davis to give these store lectures, and thank you for listening to me. regards to your last section, you said xeno-free and, and pathogen-free and contaminant-free. Does that suggest that you're using chemically defined it, it, uh, serum-free conditions? It is. That's correct. Okay. And, and so that's kind of a big area in the field because we know moving forward all the work that Osiris is doing and there, there will be a shortage in serum-based products. And, and how did you arrive at an efficient knockout media to, to do that? Is that something you use Transform for? Well, we, we could have, but basically, again, they did, we, we didn't use a transform approach. Basically, again, it was by using these kind of high-throughput approaches to find uh, what the right media would be, too. Thank you. Alex? Uh, very nice talk. I wanted to follow up on uh, Amkian's question about your last section. So when the cells are sitting in the polymers, what is the reason for changing behavior, for them maintaining pluripotency or becoming epithelial? Is it uh, secondary interactions between uh, secondary forces, uh, like uh, charge or uh, like charge uh, that guide uh, stem cell differentiation, or do you think there are kind of growth factors or ECM or ECM amounts yeah. that cells produce that bind to the spawners and that cause the? What we think. Uh, the question is what to get a little bit more color on the mechanism. What we think, and I don't think we've proven this. But what we think is that there's certain chemical structures 
that bind to certain components. Again, I'll pick the last one as an example because it's different. But there's certain chemical structures that bind very specifically to certain media components, say like vitronectin, cause it to orient in a certain way, uh, and uh, you know, uh, in in space to the cells, so that when they sit that way, uh, you get this type of behavior. And when you pick other structures, they don't do that. That would be for the last part. I think it's not for the first part of it, uh, you know, where we got the epithelial cells. I think we're less clear on, on, on what the mechanism is. But I think it could be analyzed. We, what we've tried to do over the last few years is build in high throughput everything, you know, high throughput surface analysis, high throughput uh, 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 ways of looking at contact angle, high throughput methods of looking at, um, you know, at various kinds of structure properties. So. It, so, uh, so we didn't have that when we wrote the original Nature Biotech paper, and we're, we're building all, that all into place right now with uh, various collaborations. Question back there? Yes. Well, those successful poly polymers, did you have uh, high porosity, and did the uh, cells go into the pores, or did they just stay on top? In the last set of studies, no, they, it was not high porosity. They, they, as far as we could see, they, they, sat, they stayed on top. It could. It could. I think the porosity could. I. I. Uh, but um, that's not something we looked at in detail. Certainly, we've done other studies where we have looked at porosity, and that certainly can have an effect as well. Any other questions? So, one, one last question. Have, yeah. Yes. Did you? Have, thank you very much for the outstanding talk, Bob. As usual, one of these central challenges in the IPS field to totally get away from the viral, which you are already on the face. But there is also a very great interest in delivering recombinant proteins rather than totally avoiding CMIC. Right. So I wanted to ask you, what's your feel? And give us a glimpse of protein delivery in chemically defined medium sure. towards IPS. Sure. Well, I think that's a great question. Well, first on protein delivery in general. I mean, so that's something I touched on a little bit yesterday. And I think that the techniques are there for doing protein delivery. The big issue with protein delivery, is, well, I break it down to two issues. One is going to be the stability of the proteins under sort of in vivo conditions or even 37 degree conditions in the presence of moisture. That, that probably is the biggest single practical issue for any delivering any protein today. And for IPS, I think then the question is, in addition, what would be the right substances to deliver and the right timing and so forth. Uh, so I think that's actually a great question, and that, that would be a great area to, 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 to look at. Thank you. Okay. Well, in closing, I want to thank uh, the College of Biological Sciences and the Dean, uh, the Story Lectureship, Angie Louis for organizing it, and, of course, Professor Langer for graciously giving us three talks in, uh, in a day. So we appreciate it very much. It's been an inspiration. Thank you very much again. <laughs>